You're listening to Hardscape Growth, a podcast for hungry professionals who want to grow their businesses and level up. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Hardscape Growth Show. I'm your host, Alex from Tackle Block, and today we have a returning guest uh, back by popular demand, <laughs> Wes Zimmerman from Synced Up, and today we're going to talk about some very cool stuff. I asked Wes uh, in preparation for this uh, this episode uh, if he was willing to pull back the curtain a little bit on some of the data and insights that he has visibility on as a company that has a software that helps companies run their businesses, and they consult with hundreds, if not probably close to a thousand companies now across North America. So he sees what people's numbers really are. And in the theme of keeping with the hardscape per high five and talking about knowing your numbers, and that happens to be the slogan for uh, Wes's company, we're going to dive into that today. We're going to talk about man hour pricing. We're going to talk about profit ranges, depending on the size of company that you're running. And we're going to talk about overhead ranges, depending on the size and age of your company too. So this is going to be a great episode. Wes, welcome to the show. Thanks, Alex. Good to be back. I always enjoy these. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of fun hanging out with you. All right. So um, felt it was important to talk about this because uh, the economy is still shaky. This is not a secret. This is nothing new. We've been talking about this for a few months now. Uh, a lot of people that I've been talking to are saying the phone has not been ringing nearly as much as it once was. The forms on the website are not being filled out nearly as much as they once were. Um, so people are starting to, well, not starting. They're continuing to wonder uh, if there's things they should be doing about their pricing, if they should be tightening up their margins to be more competitive. Uh, is there anything that they should be doing that can better their position so they are sure to have a strong year? Mm -hmm. So why don't we start with that man hour uh, averaging or that man hour price uh, conversation? And yeah. what are you seeing? And I guess what are you seeing in terms of big companies, small companies? What are you seeing in terms of uh, – Good ideas, bad ideas, mistakes. What do you sure. say? Well, I'll, I'll do your good idea, bad idea thing first. Um, so, it, when when things when business starts going a little shaky or, a little, or, or 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 things are changing and they're not the way they once were, you start the natural human response is to start second guessing yourself and like what you know what should I do and and I've you know I've, I'm on a lot of the industry Facebook groups and you see people frankly, underselling themselves to try to, to re, re respond and get work. Um, and you can do that as long as you don't starve yourself, meaning as long as you don't essentially put yourself out of business by selling work for less than you can produce it for. And, mm. um, in, in this whole conversation, I think that's the biggest thing to take away is like, sure, there are levers you can pull in your pricing, just make sure you're not doing it in such a way that ultimately starves your business to death, which can happen and does happen. And, um, you know, so I just want to preface this, uh, the other three things that we're going to talk about with that, like, you know, sure, there's levers we can pull and we're going to talk about those, but just make sure that um, it's grounded on, on fact and not emotion, which is tough to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and but at the same time, what I, when I say it's tough to do, I, I mean, it's it's tough to make decisions on the facts sometimes and not let your emotion get get in the way. Yeah. Well, especially if you don't have full visibility. And exactly. On the facts, and, a and B, if fear is your driving emotion because the phone's not ringing and you're like, well, we are we're not booked far enough into yes. the season. Those are the emotions that end up making us make some brash decisions. Exactly. Right? And, and the thing you said, especially when you don't have visibility, a hundred percent true. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the thing that will transport you from fear to confidence is visibility. And when you have that visibility, it, fortunately it's pretty easy to do. I mean, you have the course on hardscaper.com if you want to do it self-serve mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about some other ways you can do it too. But you know, that's what's, that's what's most important. And from what I've been seeing, like from the people I've been having conversations with, there are some companies and some markets where they're telling me, um, I'm not signing the six figure projects on the first visit. Like, cause it used to the last two, three years post COVID, it was like, um, you couldn't get a contractor to even pick up the phone. And when right. you finally did get a contractor to pick up the phone and give you a bid, it was like, where do I sign instead of mm -hmm. like, well, let me get two or three other bids. 
Yeah. You know, and so yeah. pe- that's changing. I, I'm definitely seeing that change where people are now competing normally again, I would say in my own words. Mm. Um, but I would say from based on your experience of decades in the industry, yeah. right? it's, it's feeling more like what it used to be. Well, correct. Yeah. For, for newer people to the industry, they've just seen the bananas that has been the yeah. last. And there's like, oh, this know, is normal. nearly half decade. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah. and the thing is, is that we always know that when there's a spike somewhere, there's a fall off. And, and Mm. some people will interpret that fall off as a, Oh no, you know, the sky's falling in and others will be like, well, no, we'll just adapt and overcome. You know, there's always, Mm -hmm. if you're a hard worker that produces a quality product, you, there will always be business for you, you know? Mm. Um, and I think that's the majority of this industry is is, we just have to remind ourselves to go back to being fact-based and not fear-based and not Mm emotion-based and and, and things do change and and it is natural to feel fear some fear or self-doubt or second guessing yourself on on those things but it's important to just go back to the facts instead of making quick rash decisions um and and without without i guess vetting vetting those decisions first Mm. (laughs) <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's get to those facts. Yeah. Then. So what, what what are we talking about? What are the typical ranges? And um, yeah, let's start with the ranges. Yeah. And let's see where that takes us. So with the man hours, like I would, what I'm seeing is, if you're a hardscape company that is more than, well, any hardscape company, even if you're brand new starting out, like there's pretty much no company out there that can have a healthy set of financials for less than 60 to $70 an hour. It's it, if you're less than that, there there's, there's no way to have the, the assets you need, the equipment you need to pay the people what they should be being paid to pay the business expenses that you should be, that that you have and pay yourself what you should be paying yourself. Like you could say, well, I'll charge 50, but then you completely aren't paying yourself. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. You could do that. There's people that are doing that. But are we talking about, how much I need to charge out to the customer yeah, that's, a minimum that's, per per person per hour on site? Correct. Per person per hour on site, which I call a man hour. So if you have three yeah. guys on site for eight hours, that's not eight hours. That's 24, 24. hours. Exactly. 24 times times your man hour rate. or 70. Yeah. And, and 60 that's, 70 that's is the what average I'm, or that's on the low end? That's the floor. That's on the low end. So let, let's just do that math real quick. Let's say, okay, 60 to 70. So split it down the middle, say 65 Yep. times three people times eight hours, which is 24. That's $1,560, $1,560. That is the minimum I should be charging if I'm on the small-ish side of contracting businesses for people on site. Yep. There are no materials. There's still no equipment. Yep. There's no overhead recovered in there either, right? This is just my people. No, that is that is overhead. There is overhead. There is overhead, okay. yeah. So what that means, what the, what the reason that's helpful, the math you just did there, that's helpful because now you suddenly know that, no, I can't go out there and do an $800 job for Mrs. Jones that's going to take me to 2 o'clock where I can't do another billable task that same day yet. Now you know yeah. what your floor is. No, I can't do that. I, I can't pay my bills and do that type yeah. of work. If I have a five-day project, I can't even contemplate sending people there for less than – the exact math is 7,800 bucks, but if right. it's less than eight grand, there's no materials yet. Right. Just putting people on that site is eight grand a week. Yeah. Just putting people on that site, paying them and paying your business expenses and overhead, like then, yeah. and then it's plus materials and in some cases plus equipment. It depends what, yeah. you, what your equipment is. Yeah. Okay. So what, uh, if that's on the lower end of the range, that's a company that's a, a, a handful of people, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, typically. Okay. What what's it look like when we start so getting bigger more, and and let's define what bigger is. Yeah, so that's what the, the low end I just gave you is what I would call starts with your 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 two men in a truck that are doing hardscape projects and and um and starting in, in the early startup phases, the first one to three years. After after your um what's more average is seventy to ninety dollars an hour. Um and that can be there's even startup companies that are charging that rate, which is fine. Um and there's very mature 30 employee companies that are charging those rates, which is also fine. It just depends. Like it all, it all, it all depends how these numbers shake down through your own budget, which we'll talk about more. But then on the high end, I even see people, even two, three man companies that are just saying, we're just going to do an extremely, we're going to have a niche. We're going to do, we're going to have it where we have a strong brand. We'll we, premium. We, yeah. The premium contractor doesn't necessarily mean you have 30 people. It might be three mm-hmm. people, but you're mm-hmm. a premium contractor in hiding. Like think Sean Collins group from premier outdoor. Right. Yep. So those types of companies, 
um, I, I, I see charge a hundred to $130 all the time. Mm. And, 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 the, and you know, what's funny, they get it, they get the jobs. So, well, you know why? I, I mean, I think this is important, right? Because like $65 was the floor that we were taking for our example. You just said 100 to 130. 130 is literally double. Yep. Right? Literally double. If we're talking about those smaller projects that take a week or two weeks, the difference is on one week, the difference is 7,800 bucks. Mm -hmm. You just did the math. Mm -hmm. 7,800 bucks on the job that you're going to sell for your time plus equipment plus materials plus your profit. You're going to sell it for probably 25, 30. So realistically speaking, if the client has 30 grand and I'm taking a very small, simple project, right? And maybe my numbers are wrong. And if they're wrong, you tell me you're, you're the numbers guy, but let's say it's 30 grand. If they have 30 grand to spend an extra seven or 8,000, if I have 30, I have 37, five, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, if I have 40, I have 47, five. Yeah. It's there. Or, I can get it. Or you know? on the flip side, I will decrease the scope of work to meet my 40. Right. You if know, you're really stuck at that 40. No problem. I can run the cables for the lighting this year yeah. and we can come back and do the lighting next year. Amen. I can make this a square patio instead of all these funky curves. Yep. And I can get it down to 40. Yep. You know? Yep. That's, that's the type of stuff to, to discuss, but like it is possible even in a down economy to be charging the premium rates 100%. because there's not that much of a difference on the big picture of the project. Yeah. And to clarify, like some of the, the things you were spitting out with profit and et cetera, like the man hour prices I'm giving you are with your cost overhead recovery and profit all, all included. So it truly just is materials and potentially equipment on top of that and subcontractors. If you're using subcontractors, I want to check myself. Is it, am I naive when I say that the last thing I said about that pricing, like, if I have 30, I have 37, five, like, no. is it, is it, is it that hard or that much more difficult to sell that type of work? Do you see like, cause you're working with these different clients. Do you see like when you open their eyes to the math and like, you know what, we're going to jack this up. Do they slow down on their closing rate? No, no not at all. No, no. So, in, in fact, uh, there was just a big long post on a Facebook group of somebody that had this mental battle, self doubt, you know, I can't charge X rates. And they jumped their pricing 35% in one season. And yes, they lost some of their um, maintenance clients that were they were doing. But, you know, you know, he's doing less work. He's closing just as much money. He's further ahead than he's ever been in revenue in his company. And so, you know, it it it's it it is tough because there are you're you're you end up fighting self-limiting beliefs. Like, am I really worth what? Am I really worth a hundred bucks an hour? Can I really charge that? How do I feel about myself charging hundred bucks? Can I look Mrs. Jones in the eye and say that I need hundred bucks an hour? And what's going to give you the confidence to look Mrs. Jones in the eye and say, I need hundred bucks an hour. Not that you say that you just say I need 30 grand for the project, but, right. um, is, is when you do know the truth, when you do have visibility, going back to what you said earlier, um, if you don't know the truth and it's all based on why well, he's, he's charging this and I'm trying, you know, and like, I don't have enough money, yeah. so I'm going to raise my rates. And like, if it's based on that, you're not going to have, you know, it, it, you're not going to have the confidence you need to, 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 to tell Mrs. Jones, well, I can't do this patio for 40. It's 47, but I can cut the scope and mm. bring it back to 40. I respect the fact that that's all you want to spend. You know, you, that takes confidence to be able to respond in that way. And most people need to see the math to produce that confidence. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense though. When you see the numbers, you know, this is what I have to do. Yeah. So it's not, it's not even a question of like, I don't feel like it's fair. Like, no, it's, it has to be put feelings That's aside. The minimum. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and to your question about like, you know, do the people see decreasing close rates, da, 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 you know, a, 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 a kind of a, a way I've coined a phrase is like you burn your energy on building your budget, making sure those numbers are accurate and correct. They don't lie. The numbers don't lie. Mm -hmm. Man, two plus two is always four. And then mm -hmm. turn around and burn your energy on chasing the customer that can buy what you produce mm -hmm. and, and, and don't let yourself fight head trash when you get no's from the Mrs. Jones that never could buy what you produce. Right.
You yeah. Know? Well, then it becomes a marketing question. Exactly. A question. It becomes a marketing yes. and lead gen and, and, and filtering, filtering your consultations mm. question. Mm. Because like if you're not filtering your consultations and you're like, man, I, I went out on 10 consultations this week and I only closed one. Well, you know, you can solve that problem by making sure you're answer, asking good questions in your web form or on your phone call screening process before you even go out. And there's all kind. That's another whole yeah. podcast yeah. right there. Well, exactly. There's that, and how good is your sales process? Exactly. You know, and that's that's another episode that we uh, that we had uh, come out recently with uh, okay with Jeff from uh, Groundwork, where we talked about the do's and don'ts of a good sales process to make sure that when you're in front of that customer, when you've done that work of getting that lead and pre-qualifying them and like, this is someone worth pursuing, you have a bulletproof process that's going to turn that into a sale provided that the, you know, the numbers make sense, but it's going to turn it into a sale more often than not. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's, that's another important step. And that, yep. I mean, that's, that's why, you know, that's why it, the theme of the season is the high five. You need all five to make it work. Yeah, you exactly. can't just focus They're, on one thing. None of these are a silver bullet on in and of themselves. No. And, you know, to, to your, uh, to your other question about closing rates, like right here in my local market, I have, I have a friend that's been in the industry for pretty, pretty much since I was in first grade. Like he's, okay. he's been in the industry since for 30 plus years. And, um, I say this respectfully because I respect the guy a lot. He's a hard worker, but he he is definitely um, one of those fellows that that fights the uh, self limiting beliefs. Like like, I, am, am I worth X Y Z? He, and he's in the same market that I grew up in, working for fifteen years at Tussie Landscaping, which is a premium hardscape outdoor company, you know, outdoor living company. Mm -hmm. And Tussie, the company I worked for, uh, is charging double. What he's yeah. charging and closing nine. I think the last time I asked Derek, I think he was doing 90% of the consultations he goes out on. He was closing, which, you know, at, at double at double the rate of someone in the exact same market that's charging half the rate and struggling to close the work. That's all you need to know. So the, right there, it's not the number that's the problem. It's yeah. the other things. Right. This episode is brought to you by hardscaper.com. The Hardscaper mission is to empower industry professionals with the skills, inspiration, and confidence they need to take their businesses to new heights. Struggling with training programs for your team? Looking for helpful tips to build a better company? Subscribe today to gain access to hours of interactive on-demand hardscape construction and business courses for free. Check out hardscaper.com. Right. I mean, that's that's why we do this show. Like we have to we, we have to have more confidence. Like there's a lot more opportunity than we're allowing ourselves to tap into. Mm -hmm. Speaking of opportunity and tapping into it, let's shift gears. Let's talk about the profits because you have visibility over that too. And ultimately, if I open a business, it's to turn a profit. Yep. What what are the profit ranges that you are seeing? And um you know, help me explore. Yeah. Help, let's help the audience understand, like, what do we mean when we're saying profit ranges and, and yeah. type of gross profit, net profit, and so on and so forth. So I like to pay attention to net profit because that, that, that's the truth. Gross profit can hide a lot of, um, you know, you, I don't, if you're making 50% gross profit, but 45% of that's going out for your overhead expenses. And that's, that leaves you with a 5% net. That's not worth being in business for, you know? Mm. And unfortunately, by the time, in this industry by the with some studies that have been done by the time people truly pay all their bills and and and, and, and truly have what they're left like they're in single digits net profit which is again yeah. not worth being in business for um and what i w when we help people build a budget we kind of have a policy of like we're not going to let you walk away with a budget that's less than 10 percent net profit if it's less than 10 percent, one little mishap and believe me the mishaps will happen can wipe you out you know, and 10% even is not really enough to, to produce the capital needed to quickly scale a company. You could grow a company over 30 years to a five, $10 million landscape company at 10% net profit, but you won't be able to grow from 1 million to 5 million in five years at a 10% net profit. There's just not enough of capital there. Mm -hmm. And so it depends a little bit on what your goals are for your company. Like, are you looking for slow growth lifestyle business? Are you looking to scale and sell? Like, what, what are your goals? And, you know, so you can produce a good lifestyle business at 10% net profit with um, slow growth. What, what does that mean, lifestyle business? 
Me, like when I say lifestyle business, I mean that you're not looking to become the biggest, baddest contractor around with the most trucks and the most employees. You're just looking to be to be a premium contractor that you do what you love. You're not looking to become bigger. You're just looking to become better and more profitable and and, and live a quality lifestyle while owning your business. And 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 you're not looking to work yourself out of the business because you you enjoy doing it. You want to do it for the next 20, 30 years. Um, but you want to do it in a way that the business provides you with a good lifestyle, like that you're not starving okay. and not paying yourself, et cetera. Gotcha. So the floor for that type of setup, in your opinion, is 10%. 10% net. Yeah, 10% is minimum. But what I like to see is 15 to 20. And I know of some contractors that are even above 30. Um, and, um, and again, it's funny how, you know, the same is true for the, the thing we said, well, Here's two contractors in the exact same market. One charges double, and the and the, the one that's charging double has a higher close rate than the one, the one that charges half. You know, it's interesting how that works. And so, well, there's a, I think there's a psychology involved. There yeah, too. there is. When it's, you're when you're too cheap, people are like, hundred uh, yeah. percent. Yeah, it, I have. In, think of think of experiences with yourself. I don't know. Go hire a plumber. Or, I don't know, go hire a contractor. Yeah. Like if you get the cheap guy, you're, you're like, I don't want the cheap. Yeah, I'm like, eh, how many problems am I gonna, am I gonna have yeah. <laughs> by hiring this guy? Like, I just want to know it's done, and I, and I don't want to have problems. Right. You know, exactly. I want it done, and I want to forget about it. After. Yeah, like it, exactly. I forget it ever happened. So you know? if you're if you're struggling with self limiting beliefs around price, just know that like the price is not. Yeah. You know, people, you will lose a job for being too cheap. I I, I can tell you stories yeah. about how that's happened. You know, dude, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. Back to the net profit. It's got to be a minimum of ten percent, and and that w that won't produce quick scale. That'll produce a slow growth over many years. Um, Twenty percent will produce more capital that will allow you to scale more fit more effectively more quickly. Uh, I like to be in that fifteen to twenty percent range. Anything over twenty percent is a bonus. But the the um, the thing that I'll clarify is this is after you've paid yourself a take home salary. Like the business needs to make this profit after there's literally not another bill left to pay and you've already paid yourself your living wage. And you can go out there and get a job. If, if, if you're a hard worker and develop, you know, develop your skills, you, there, there's, there's no reason you can't have a six-figure job um, out there in the market, in the workforce, right. right? So It is possible. Yeah. So – if you would develop, if you would pour the same amount of energy and, and sacrifice into your job as you do into your business, you would have a six figure job. No, no, you know, you would. So, mm -hmm. so what the case I'm making is the business needs to pay you more than a thousand bucks a week. You know, it needs to pay you a, 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 at least as good as you could if you were developing your career in a non entrepreneurial way. Mm -hmm. um, That's an and, important point, too, though. You know, yeah. if you, if you looked on and, and you can use, the, well, I mean, you can Google things. You could even, uh, I've, I've really liked playing around with chat GPT the last few yeah. months, but just, <laughs> just even saying like, what would be the job position of someone who does this, 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 and then it'll give you a title. And then what is the typical salary for this role in this part of the United States? And it'll give you a range. And if that range looks crazy to what you're paying yourself right now, give your head a shake and then look at your numbers and see how could I get there? Cause that's with yeah. everything I'm doing. I should be earning that. Yeah. The business that, needs that's to okay. Like it's, it's, you're not, it's not, it's not greedy. It's not, um, it's not shameful. It's not, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah. You're assuming all of the risk. Yeah. An employee assumes no risk. Yeah. You need and to pay yourself. So the words of it should be paying yourself at least as much as the market value of the task you do as in a salary, like it is at least is the key word, yeah. you know, because you're taking all this risk in addition to this. And, yeah. and many times, you know, owners will say, well, I'd be happy with 80 grand a year. OK, fine. I can no worries. You go ahead. That that I have no criticism of that. But yeah. the, the only thing I would say is. What would be in when we're building a budget? This is what the, this is the way I frame the question: Is what would be the market value if you stopped working in the business completely and you had to hire people to replace yourself? Some owners out there would have to hire three people, mm. you know, an admin, an, an ops manager, and a salesperson. Yeah, you know, and so 
because they're working like an animal. And so what would be the market salary of this position, this position, and this position all added up together? Now, I'm not saying you have to take that and take home pay, and, and but that's what you should no. have in your budget. That's right. That needs to be coming in because the day that you're like, I'm not going to do all these things myself anymore. You can't just like, oh, oh, geez, we can't afford it. Like Exactly. Build build the environment so that you can move within it with ease. Yeah. I so whether you do key, the task right? or you decide I don't want to do the task anymore, I'm going to hire someone. The, buzz, the business is set up financially and is pricing its work financially in a way that will allow it to do so. Otherwise, yeah. you're in prison. You're in entrepreneurial prison, and, you know, because the business has you for free. Yeah. <laughs> just crazy. Yeah. So that 15 to 20 percent is your your sweet spot as you're saying yeah what what percentage of businesses are you seeing that you you guys talk to in those initial consults that are outside of that that are hanging out in that danger zone of single digits where yeah. you're saying it's not worth it because one mess up and like pfft, yeah you, that, you, your, your whole company's been operating for free you know that's a really good question um i would say it's probably 20 to 30% are in genuinely what I would call in the danger zone. Like, like where they're not paying themselves, they're, they're making single digits in net profit. They're, the cash flows in, is in dire straits. And, um, yeah, at least 20 to 30%. It might even be higher than that. <clears throat> but of the people who are, that's 20 to 30% of the companies that are reaching out to they're you saying, Hey, I need to help. be better. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Right. So the, the industry average is probably higher because there's so many people out there that they're not going to come to us because they don't believe they need us. And the they there's a couple outcomes that can come from that. Either they will one day have a change of heart and they will come to us or start or figuring it out on their own through the course or mm -hmm. the spreadsheets or whatever. Yeah, there's free spreadsheets. Yeah, so, you, you don't you don't have to use a paid product. There are ways to figure out. It, yeah. It's just genuine math. Um, yeah. Either that will happen, either they'll have a change of heart and they will change their ways, or they'll slave away in the business their entire life, and at the end of their working years, will have nothing to show for it, yeah. or they will go out of business. So something will happen that will drain them of cash, and they'll go out of they'll they'll reach their complexity ceiling, or their stress tolerance level ceiling, and and will say, I don't want to do this anymore. And, yeah. and go out of business. So if you want to control the outcome at the end of your career, whenever it is, yeah. either by choice or by force, you need to be in those double digits. Of 100%. Profit. Okay. Um, are you seeing a difference between small companies and big companies with the net profit? Not or really, or no. Because no? whether you're doing 500,000 or 5 million, it's, it's kind of the same. I, I would say if anything, maybe there's some people hungry – entrepreneurs out there, they're just getting started that yes, they only did 500,000 last year, but they're on their way to one and two and three and 4 million. And they want to produce the capital to grow that debt free or whatever. So they will intentionally do a 20 or 30% net profit to try to boost that scaling capacity quicker. Yeah. 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 Basically build a rocket booster for yeah. myself. And yeah, you know, here's the 10 points. Yeah. Here, here's the yeah. thing about that. This whole conversation is the budget tells you your floor. Like when, when you build your budget and it says, here's your man hour price, that's the floor. You can't charge any less than that without going on cutting expenses somewhere anyway. Yeah. Um, the market is the only thing that dictates your ceiling. You can always charge more than what your budget tells you, but you can't charge less. Like it, the only, the, the market dictates, what I mean by that is like, if you, even in spite of excellent sales, excellent consultation, filtering, excellent lead generation, in, if you, in spite of having a really strong position in those three things, can't sell work, now you've found your ceiling. Mm. There you go. Yeah. The market will, will give you an indication on the, the, the top end, but your yeah. budget is the floor. Yeah. The budget's the floor. You can't, you can't, doesn't matter which way you slice and dice it, you can never charge less than what your budget tells you. Uh, but you can always charge more. And the only thing that will tell you that, that should make you second guess yourself in charging more is if you have a solid operation in lead gen and in a sales process, et cetera, and still can't sell work. Mm hmm.
Mm -hmm. And there is a case to be made sometimes, and, you know, with economic external pressures like economic conditions and all of that. There is a case to be made sometimes that like I do need to lower my price. So what I will do to lower my price is go cut Probably. expenses, go cut yeah. assets, go cut and, and, and adopt a bit of a different business model so that the end dollar per hour or the end uh, uh, price is is less than what I had been because really what dictates that is what business model do you have? Do you have a fleet of trucks, highly paid employees, skilled, you know, there's going to be a price tag for that. Are you, are you running a commodity service where it's, it's in and out, not really custom work per se. You kind of have your kit of your suite of things that you do and you're, you're extremely focused on efficiency as opposed to custom works of art. Then yeah, that, that's a different model. And you can, you know, you can swing your pricing based on adopting different models like that. So, I kind of want to explore that a little bit. Like, do you have any any concrete examples of what those changes could be where I'm not compromising on my margin, mm -hmm. but I am lowering my expenses to position myself to be more competitive because the market is a little lighter and I'm still hungry? Yeah. So um, one example would be quite often, you know, people like toys, uh, uh, and quite often we run into companies that they frankly have way too much overhead in, in equipment, okay. uh, it, it, for, for the size of like, they might be a $700,000 business, but they have the equipment that could run a two or $3 million business, you know, give me some practical examples. Like, well, what, 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 what do these guys have that I probably don't need? Yeah. I mean, Let's say you're three years into your business. You're between 500 and a million. You're driving around in brand new trucks. You have more. You, you have two or three skid loaders. You have an excavator with a brand new tilt rotator. You know, you, you're you're just overbuilt for mm -hmm. for where you're currently at. Not nothing is wrong with any of those things in and of themselves. It's just that where are you at in your journey? And what will your business sustain? Because if you're only producing, say, $500,000 in revenue, there's no money left to pay for all of those things and pay you and produce a profit. Like you've got to build the business along with your acquisition of assets. Is it as simple as saying like stop buying, start renting? Well, a one way to think about that, that is I would, I would rent if you're like, man, I would love to have it, whatever. Uh, I would rent until the cost of renting is more than me owning it outright. Which, you know, that's a principle that has been spoken about that's, many yeah, times before. Idea. Yeah. But um, that's definitely one thing. Um, what was the original question again? It was about it was examples. Because you were saying expenses. like tri trimming the expenses yes. to be more competitive without compromising on your margin. So you another the one. Toys, that's, that's one that stands out for sure. Like if you're riding around in a jacked up f-350 and you're never towing anything because you're the boss right yeah <laughs> why are you doing that yeah i mean you know, which you're is running awesome. sales calls what the hell do you need to roll up with that giant thing for yeah which is awesome like kudos to you if you can do that and it's pay great for it. but, sure i want one too but like but if it's not in the budget it's not in the budget yeah if you're struggling with selling work then eh, you might want to rethink that you know yeah but um another example is contractors uh that will like get into work big jobs too quickly. Uh, and what I mean is like maybe your your bread and butter is ten to thirty thousand dollar projects and then you get a two hundred thousand dollar opportunity and and you're making the jump from ten to thirty to two hundred in in one leap and there are things that you miss along the way and um and, and what happens is sometimes for some businesses you're better off saying no to the projects that maybe you would love to do for bragging rights or whatever and just focus on being extremely efficient and setting yourself up to be maximum efficiency uh, at 10 to 30 or 30 to $50,000 projects and, and just say we're probably not the best fit for the massive projects because we're, we're not set up with the skill levels we have and the the processes we have and the equipment that we're familiar with to do those massive projects. Now I'm not saying that's not for every, that, that's, you know, that's not for all of these things need to be taken with a grain of salt, because if that is truly your, your goal is to grow to those big multi six figure projects, absolutely possible. You, yeah. You need to take some on to build up yeah. that baggage of experience. Yeah. But if you get outside your wheelhouse too fast and too often, 
you're more prone to mistakes and those mistakes uh, can be costly and they'll force you to jack up your expenses because of inexperience because yeah, so you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. And to kind of yeah. to put a, to kind of put a ribbon on the scenario I was trying to paint there, it's like let's say you are like you, you are the company that has been comfortable with 10 to $30,000 projects. You get an opportunity at $200,000 and then you suddenly start going out there and like, well, I need this and I need this. And you go out there and outright buy the equipment instead of rent it, you know, and mm-hmm. suddenly now your overhead burden and on, on your cost of doing business has raised to the, itself to the point where you can't be as profitable anymore on the 10 to 30 mm-hmm. or, or your price has to go from to 15 to 40. What no, used to be 10 to 30. Yeah, you're pricing yourself out of your bread and butter yeah. in pursuit of the new bread and butter. Right, which you can do so that. It's, like, it's just like yeah. it, it's if you a, jump steps and make it harder on yourself. That's basically what it comes down to. Yeah. You can, you can. And in Everyone the same way, skip steps. in the same way that a, a, a maybe a, a premium company with 20, 30 employees um, says like the, kind of the math we were doing there on the on the back of a napkin just in the beginning of this mm-hmm. is like, you know, I can't go out there for less than 1500 bucks a day, you know. The same way that a big company will say, I can't go out there. I can't do a job for less than five grand a day. Um, a small company, you know, the, the same is true for a, fo- a small company. It's like for me to assume the expenses, acquire the skills, acquire the equipment needed to do the multi six figure projects. It's too soon for where I'm at in my journey. I need to work my way up to it or I need to mm-hmm. work with a mentor on it or I need to work as a subcontract or whatever the whatever mm-hmm. the scenario is like. But in the same way that a big company can't go out for less than five grand a day where you or your minimum is maybe 2,500 a day and you can crush that and make good money on it. You know, yeah. the same is true in both directions, whether you're small or big. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's, well, uh, by the way, before we get too far into this, uh, I don't want to leave this just for the end. We'll, we'll call it back up at the end, but, uh, you were telling me that, uh, Given the cir- current economic circumstances, uh, Synced Up is is offering like some free consult consultation calls. Yeah, so like what, just basically call and talk shop. Yeah, so we were like, like you you know as we were just talking before the the we we were hitting record like what could we do to for, to help people and like what we're do what, what I would like to do is just give you a link where if you're listening to this and it, uh, you'd like to like, Hey, I want to do my budget. Maybe I've already had, maybe, maybe if you've, I've already taken the hardscaper course and I've already built my budget, but I'd like someone to look over my shoulder and just check it with me real quick. And like, or just bounce a couple questions off. Like um, I'll give you a link where you can book a call and we'll just jump on a zoom call and, and you can uh, share your, like, Hey, here's where I'm at. Here's what I've done. Here's what I'm thinking. Is there anything I'm missing? You know, what, just a consultative type call just to just to kind of give back and help out anybody that feels like they're they need some clarity or some confidence in in what they're cool. in the path they're trying to take yeah well i mean that's that's great because that's that's right in the in the spirit of uh why we do the show and it's a perfect example of adding value to the relationships that we have with our listeners so we have that free course on hardscaper.com uh it's the budget uh budgeting estimating and job costing course mm-hmm super in depth. Uh, it's, it really is a great course. There's some free resources to download spreadsheets to build out your budgets and build out your pricing at no cost to you. Just do the work or you can, uh, hop on the synced up bandwagon, like hundreds of companies have done again this year. And, uh, but if you do want to kind of talk shop and figure out like, okay, I need to talk to someone else, just get an opinion on these numbers. They're going to, they're offering that for free. And we'll put that link in the description uh, of this uh, episode and it'll be on the uh, hardscaper.com podcast page as well. Yep. Uh, let's go into our last, our last bucket of information here today, which is the overhead ranges. And this works well because the last thing we were talking about was, you know, managing those expenses and understanding how you get too big, too fast. Or you try to take on too many things too quickly. It throws your expenses out of whack and you can't recover enough of those expenses at the current bread and butter projects that you have. Mm-hmm. So what are those overhead ranges that you're seeing today and what are some of maybe the things that um stand out to you as great practices or terrible practices yeah um so the the overhead ranges is the one that varies the most from company to company like if you're a new startup your overhead the portion the uh, let's just say let's just use a hundred dollars an hour the portion yeah. the percentage of dollars per hour out of that hundred dollars an hour price um that go to overhead expenses will be less for a smaller company, uh, maybe even a newer company, a less skilled, more high, more efficient, less less custom type company. 
Um, but the bigger your company goes, grows, the more assets you acquire, the more skills you acquire, the more mature your brand to, you know, the, you get an office, you get a shop, you, you know, you, you get an admin, you get, you, the more of that that happens, um, the more, the higher the percentage allocated to overhead recovery will go. And kind of a really like lick your finger and hold it up to the wind, just like a general uh, thing you can use to, as a rule of thumb is 30, 30, 30, 10, uh, which is 30% of a man hour price will typically go to the cost, 30% or 30 percent of a job price will typically go to the cost of um, labor, 30% will go to the cost of material, 30% will go to the cost of overhead, 10 will go to profit. Now take any of those and give or take 5% and you could end up with 20 or 30% profit. And some people are going to say, well, I want more than 10. So that's a terrible rule of thumb. Well, yeah, I, I get that. Take it with a grain of salt. But so like, it's a guideline. Yeah, it's, it's a, a guideline. guideline. So, But the 30, 30, 30, 10 means like, you know, if you have $5,000 worth of expenses in labor, $5,000 worth of expenses in materials on a job, you probably already also have $5,000 worth of overhead expenses to do that job. Hmm. Plus you need your profit. You know, so that's a good way of, which is why people will sometimes say, take the materials and triple it. <laughs> that's a terrible way. To, don't ever bid a job that way. But that's a, that's a good place. That's a good way to arrive at a rough. You're still forgetting the profit out of there, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, but so the point I'm making to answer your question is your overhead percentage, even in a new company is not going to be less than 30%. Or if, if it is, it's, it's, it's probably not, it's probably an unrealistic picture, meaning you're not paying yourself or you're operating, you're not, mm. you're not putting your trucks and in, in stuff into your over, you know, there, there's something that's off or maybe maybe unique you know i'll give room for that you know about you about your business model um so and, on on a fifty thousand dollar job and, and maybe actually maybe you know this information uh do you know what the average job is selling for right now i i don't know that off the top okay. of my head no all right but let's say it's 50 yeah just for easy math that means that there's fifteen thousand materials fifteen thousand materials I mean, it doesn't go as far as it used to. So when you put all, everything together, it's maybe maybe a thousand square foot patio with a little fire pit and simple seating wall and mm -hmm. some plantings. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what we're talking about. Maybe there's some lighting in the planting beds and stuff. That's probably what we're talking about as a job. Uh, so 30% of that is your, uh, sorry, 15,000 would be the materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could swing that, I think. 15,000 would be the labor, which that's also gone up. Same, same, same story. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And 15,000 would be your overhead. Mm -hmm. And if you're like a three person crew, that 15,000, that's a, it's a, we're talking about a close to a two week job based on the math that we did. That's mm -hmm. an eight or nine day job, mm -hmm. which yeah, 50,000, eight or nine day job, three people. You know, pretty, yeah. pretty light on the equipment. We got a skid loader or a dingo or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it would make sense. And then 5,000 would be my net profit left at the end. Yep. And that's assuming it's a 10% net. And, you know, you could, yeah. all of these numbers are, you could tweak until you arrive at a 20% or whatever. Like yeah. it, it's, these are rules. of. But the, there's not that much left at the end is, is no. the, the point, you know, like no. that's a lot of money exchanging hands, but what's left at the end as profit for the company, there's not that much. And that's if everything goes well and you did your math right. Exactly. And what trips people up is like in those numbers, 15 for labor and 15 for materials, you take we that out, there. there's still yeah. 20 left. Right. And it's easy to look at the, to cash that check and be like, bam, I made 20 grand in pro. Hang on a sec. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the unfortunate reality is, is if you, if you tell yourself, great, I made 20 grand in profit the truth does not make itself evident and force itself into your awareness until much later in cash flow. Yeah. So you can survive tell, lying to your, not lying to yourself. You can survive with a false. Well, ignorance is bliss. Right? Yeah. That's, with that's a false perspective for some time. Yeah. Before this finally catches up with you. Yeah. In which in a, another way to think about it is like five grand on a $50,000 job. Yeah. That's why you can't negotiate from 50 to 45. Exactly. Without changing any scope or changing anything. Yeah. 
And if you're the type of person that likes to negotiate, then we'll start at 60 or start at 57 or something. Nego- you know, like, the way I like to yeah. say it is negotiate on scope. I will negotiate on scope yeah. all day long, but not on price. Yeah. Exactly. You know? Um, what, uh, what was I going to ask you about overhead? What are the things that go in overhead? Some, yeah. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people listening know well, that. Let me rattle off a couple that people often miss. Um, often, often people are working from their own property or something. And they don't have. They're not paying for a shop per se. Um, I, I'm like, I, the way I like to think about that is like, okay, fine. The business is not writing a check to a, to rent a property or a shop, but it needs to it needs to pay you because you own the property, or you know, you know, whatever the market rate is of. Let, let's say you could no longer operate your business from where you're operating it. What would you have to pay? market rate to go continue operating like that should be in your budget whether it's being paid in cash or not and what if i said like psh, like it's my house it's my property i have like 10 acres what what who cares why do i need to pay myself i own it because let's say that um i mean let me just try to draw a scenario that might could be real life let's say the town yeah, i'm putting out, you on the spot yeah, here so let, let's say know. the township comes out and says now you can't do this anymore you have to go oh, you have zoning, it's not, zoning it's changes zoned. Yeah, you, it's okay. residential. You can't operate a business from here. Um, and for some of you, you're like, well, I live in a, in a rural, well, fine, whatever. Take the analogy and run with it. But like the, the point <laughs> is, is the, the point is, is the business has to be set up financially on its pricing that it can pay for all costs of doing business, whether those costs are, are, are actual real cash costs today or not. Like you would mm-hmm. want to be able to be, to move. And start paying a market rate for a, a, a lot or a or shop or something and not have to change your pricing. Mm-hmm. You know, the business, the business, if you have the luxury of not having that expense on your profit and loss, that's a luxury. And 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 you don't want to bank. You want to budget for worst case scenario. You don't want to bank on that being true for the best case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And what which, are some which other brings, things that people miss? Which brings, oh, sorry, a, no. I was yeah. just gonna say, which brings an important part in this whole budgeting thing. Always budget for worst case scenario. You know, if you think you're going to spend 20 grand in fuel this year, put in 30. If you think you're going to spend X in materials this year, bump it up 5%, you know, whatever. Like you should always budget for worst case scenario because then when it works, if you budget for best case and worst case happens, guess who pays for it? You do. What was supposed to be your profit goes to pay for it. Yeah. And if you do that too badly, and many people do, if that happens too badly, um, you literally run yourself out of cash. Yeah. You know, but other things that people miss, um, well, not paying themselves at least, or, or, or not paying themselves a, a true market value um, is another big one, constant. Um, another big one is equipment. So people will, will say, well, it's paid for. I bought it three years ago and I paid for it in cash and it doesn't, I don't have a payment for it. It's just maintenance and fuel. And, um, okay, sure. But let me, th- that piece of equipment is depreciating every year. Meaning like you bought it at say a hundred grand and you're going to keep it for, I don't know, let's say 10 years and you're going to sell it for 20 grand. It depreciated $80,000 in those 10 years you owned it. And, and in those 10 years, that meant it depreciated $8,000 a year. That is an expense that does not show up on a profit and loss statement, which is why it's so tricky. But it is a real expense to your business, and it's a big one. So, yeah. you know, there's two schools of thought with equipment, which it, we talk about this in the course on Hardscaper. But it, yeah. it's like you can charge for equipment by the hour or by the day. Like charge for it as a line item on your bids, or you yeah. can count it as an overhead expense, and it's just baked into your hourly rate. Both are viable options. Both have pros and cons. You just have to make sure you know the pros and cons and make sure you don't fall into the con trap of any of the option you choose. Um, and we, we talk about it in depth in the course. So I would tell you to go there to, to learn if you're not yeah. sure what you want to do. But um, that's a big one because people are like they have all this equipment that's depreciating and they're not bait and they're not factoring it into their pricing anywhere. And it doesn't catch up to them until they need to go replace it. And then they were pricing their work for the last umpteen years as if they had that for free and now they have to write say an a hundred thousand dollar check or an eighty thousand dollar check to go replace it and 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 they haven't been They're pricing the work to produce those funds yeah so what was going to be your profit goes to pay for it mm-hmm. yeah well, that's that's four a good one so not paying for the space that you're using even if it is your own home and you own it and it's paid for yep you should still be recovering that because you may need to move yep you you may want to move. Yeah, you, know, you may want to move. Exactly. Be, 
Uh, not paying yourself, obvious one. Uh, not recovering equipment, even if uh, it's paid in full. Mm-hmm. And not recovering a, a depreciation of assets. Well, yeah, and, and the equipment and depreciation of assets. Kind of goes in that equipment, but I mean... Uh, you yeah. have other assets too. Exactly. Equipment right? is one asset. And the other, the yeah. other thing I'll, I'll just put onto that is because people will sometimes bring this up is like depreciation from a tax perspective, what your CPA tells you when you're filing your taxes and depreciation yeah. from a budgeting perspective to find out what you should charge in your business are two different topics. They're, yes, they're, they're, we're using the same word depreciation, but radically different uh, factors at play. So don't go off of what I'm trying to say is don't go off of what your CPA is doing for depreciation on your assets, that's on your taxes. Yeah, yeah, it's that's a, different a different thing. thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Wes, anything else you want to add on this subject? We've covered man hour pricing. We've covered profit ranges. We've talked talked about overhead ranges. We've talked about do's and don'ts and common mistakes and pitfalls. Uh, anything else you want to add here before we uh, sign off for this week? You know, I, I would just say, you know, we can have fun having these nuts and bolts conversations about numbers and how two plus two equals four all the time. And it's fun. It, it, you know, for me anyway, it is. I enjoy it. Yeah, but um, but at the end of the day, just just take just remember this. If you remember anything at the end of the day, the numbers are what they are. You can't change the numbers. You can't argue the numbers. It, it, it's like get visibility into your numbers and then turn around and build your, burn your energy on your sales process and your marketing. Like that's where your energy should be burnt. That's where you're going to grow the business, burning your energy on and, and, and trying to argue and trying to say that people won't pay what my budget tells me I have to charge is, is energy poorly spent. You're, you're, you're much better off just the numbers are what they are. Turn around and burn your energy on developing yourself as an, a machine of a salesperson or an excellent sales process, excellent marketing, lead gen, brand development. You know, That's where your energy should be burnt. That's what's going to grow your business. Arguing with the numbers and, and fiddling with things to try to shave 3% off your pricing isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to grow your business. Do the math lock in the numbers once you know. Build for right. that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Wes, thanks a lot for uh, joining us on the show. Once again, that link for that uh, uh, calendar booking is going to be in the description. The course is on hardscaper.com. It's entirely free. All you need to do is uh, create an account, which is free. Click on the course, get started. And even the resources linked in the courses are free. So, I mean, it's a lot of free value there. So thank you <laughs> very no much. Reason, there's no reason in this day and age to say I didn't know. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, man. Well, thanks a lot for joining us on the show. And uh, until next time, everyone, work hard, pave harder, and we'll see you next week on the Hardscape Growth Podcast. Have a good one, guys. You've been listening to Hardscape Growth, a podcast for hungry professionals who want to grow their businesses and level up. Each episode is all about taking the next step in running your business. So make sure you never miss a show by subscribing on your favorite podcast player. And if you're finding this information to be useful, help others in your position discover us by giving us a star rating and leaving a comment. We'll see you next week.